Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, we may be adding people as we go along. Um, so um, Hope will be the one that will open the door and let people in if they're knocking. Um, welcome to the Northern Virginia Local Arts Agency workshop on evaluation for arts and culture organization. I'm Cheryl Ann Colton. I'm a regional program director with the Office of the Arts, the city of Alexandria. And I am, I'll say I'm in that senior age um, individual um, who has kind of a bob haircut, um, thin framed glasses. I'm wearing a yellow sweater, I'm trying to think of it being spring out. Um, my background is my dream sunroom. Someday I will have a sunroom like this. Um, it's very, um, bright and it has tropical plants um, and I use the pronouns um, she and her. Um, before we get started um, we want to encourage you to rename yourself if you can or uh, you can place um, information um, in the Q&A feature um, as it relates to your pronouns. Um, you will be muted for most of the session um, but you can ask questions in the Q&A um, and you can use the raise hand feature and then throughout the uh, presentation, uh, you will be unmuted um, and we will then pause for some questions. We will share the slide deck from today's presentation by email. We will also be sharing, uh, we are going to be recording this session and it will be available for those who have signed up. So thank you all for being here. Um, now, um, even though we're virtual, uh, we'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Alexandria, Arlington, and Fairfax are located in the traditional land of the Elgangwe um, and other indigenous people who were part of or allies with the um, Powhatan chiefdom, past and present. A little bit about the um, Northern Virginia local arts agencies. Um, these are local arts agencies in Arlington County, the city of Alexandria, and Fairfax County. We've joined together for this um, alliance. Um, it's the Northern Virginia local arts agencies. And we've been doing this to expand our resources and opportunities for artists and arts organizations throughout the Northern Virginia area. We, this is the um, uh, first um, session or workshop on evaluation. We will be hosting another one um, with the same pre presenter on June 1st, and we'll do a deeper dive into um, evaluation. So um, if you're excited about this, we hope you are, and we are going to encourage you, to, if you have not already done so, to sign up for that sec second session. And now I'm pleased to welcome Rory Nooner, who will be leading this workshop and the one on June 1st. She is a seasoned learning and evaluation professional and adjunct professor in program evaluation and monitoring at American University. She currently serves as the learning officer at the Boston-based Bar Foundation, where they support efforts to gauge the foundation's impact and support ongoing learning. So Rory, the, the floor is yours. Thanks, Cheryl Ann. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, we're delighted to have you here today. Uh, see a number of you in the participant list and um, want to encourage you to um, we're, work. We're trying to make this as interactive as possible in the webinar mode. So um, bear with us as we do that and um, ready to kick things off. So um, today's, uh, today's session is on uh, evaluation for arts and culture organizations. Um, I, I do, before we get started, just want to, again, say thank you to the folks from Northern Virginia Local Arts Agencies. Um, I, so Cheryl Ann, thanks for the introduction again, and Hope, um, thank you for all of your um, logistical uh, uh, magic. Um, I know you've been the one I've been working with, with most closely, so thank you so much. Um, so as uh, Cheryl Ann referenced, this is the first workshop and we'll do a follow-up, uh, which is on June 1st in a couple of weeks. A little time for you to let this percolate um, and then jump into that uh, our workshop as well. So today is designed to be like a 101 session for beginners. Um, that said, um, I really think that people who maybe even have more knowledge of program evaluation can get things um, out of today's workshop, I know um, in my current role, I'm often challenged to like go back to the basics, as it were. Um, and and so so I, I hope whether you're brand new to this or you're um, you know a stealth 
uh, professional in evaluation on today's webinar, you'll you'll get something out of it. Um, okay. So uh, a little bit about me, Cheryl and covered most of it, uh, the high details. I'd say a couple of things. Um, I work for a foundation doing evaluation work. So I read, um, I read a lot of grant proposals. I also think with program teams writ large a lot about like strategy, what grantees are trying to accomplish and what we're trying to accomplish as a foundation. What is the impact of where all this money is going? Um, uh, that includes at the Bar Foundation, we do have an arts and creativity program that funds work in Massachusetts, across the state of Massachusetts. So uh, I'm delighted to be able to work with those folks. I also previously worked as an independent consultant, including working with small nonprofit organizations, including some arts organizations um, on things like strategy and evaluation. So um, hopefully I can, I can answer some questions for you here today. So in terms of today's agenda, just to give you a quick sense um, of of the roadmap for today. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, like evaluation through a little bit of a different frame. So evaluation through the frame of narrative and storytelling. Um, we are also gonna dig into some of the very traditional elements of one of the cornerstones of evaluation practice, which is to some of you, this dreaded thing called a logic model. It's really not so bad. Um, and so we'll, we'll, I'll be weaving the storytelling, storytelling idea, the narrative idea, in with these traditional pieces. And the idea is you'll come out of this with a holistic uh, a piece of information from which to think about your own work. So um, that's an overview where we're headed. And a couple of norms for today. I think um, if folks can try to be present, that will, that will really help us out today. Um, and then I think being curious. So Evaluation work can be really hard if people aren't open to like the possibilities inherent in their work or thinking about their work in new and different ways. Um, so just be open minded today about like, I'm running this program, I've been running this program for a long time, but there might be a new wrinkle or a new way to look at it, a new lens that you might be able to put on the work. Um, same thing with be creative, very similar, like being open minded to um, different possibilities for ways to think about the impact of your work. Um, so <laughs> this slide is, um, I think how many people feel about evaluation. And, um, I will say that as an evaluation professional, um, it's not, evaluation is like not a path to become a more popular person. Um, you're not more well-liked when you show up to a party and say that you, what you do is program evaluation for, uh, for a living. Um, and I think that this is, uh, incredibly warranted. I, as someone who works for foundations, I know a lot of funders have used evaluation over time to hold organizations um, accountable for things, to monitor them, to collect data on things that maybe the nonprofit organization doesn't actually care a whole lot about, and it's not clear how that's adding up to impact. And so um, I'm committed to like a bigger, a bigger and longer legacy of like how can we actually make this this work um, enjoyable, uh, dare I say, even fun. Um, and impactful to make sure that we're really accomplishing the, the kinds of things we want to accomplish. Um, there's a reason we get up in the morning and that you all work for arts organizations. And so like, how do we connect this to, to that, that passion? Um, Hope, can I just check in with you for one second? Um, we, do, we don't have chat, right? We do. We do have chat. Um, yes, so everybody should be able to... Uh, message everyone else. And through the chat function? Yes. So I would love it if um, folks could take the opportunity to maybe quickly say hello, um, introduce themselves, like your name and your organization, and maybe an adjective for how you feel about evaluation. And if the chat for some reason is still not working for you, maybe you could raise your hand. Oh, there we go, Brett. You love evaluation. Okay. Okay, Brett. <laughs> Paralyzing is a good one. Okay. Jane is a is a pragmatist, necessary. I like it. 
This is this is fun. Okay, Sherelle says enjoyable. Um, thank you, Jason. I'm glad you're here. Um, nice. Okay, so these are these impressions are are not as um, thank you, Tiffany. Not as uh, not as negative as they might always be, but I'm sure we've all felt this way, the sad face about evaluation. <laughs> okay, unsure. All right, so we have we have a, a, a diverse range of perspectives. Thanks for thanks for saying hello, folks. Um, and then I think the next thing to think about is, and I see this and feel this as a grant maker, and I'm sure you're all seeing and feeling this in your everyday life. Um, you know, this gentleman here who's holding a, a, a cell phone, we are just living in a time where we're inundated with information. You all know this, you, you know this deeply. Um, and I think that in the nonprofit world and nonprofit sector, I think it's, try, it's hard to sort out the noise um, and really tell your story and, and, and solve the impact of the work that you're trying to do in meaningful ways. Um, I know on the funding side of the table, and I'll share some more of this a little bit later. Um, you know, I, as grant makers, there's not a day that goes by where it's not like there are a hundred ideas, great ideas, good work going on, um, and we can fund one of them. And so I think that there's, the, you know, this is, this is why thinking about impact and strategy and storytelling and narrative can be helpful. This again, is is not anything that's, that's new to you all. Um, so there really is this better way. There's this path through using narrative. Um, and I, I'll, I'll say a couple of things here. Um, we're going to talk about evaluation in the context of storytelling and narrative today. People who study storytelling, I think for a living would say like, be really careful about using the term storytelling. Cause what we really mean there is like actual dramatic narratives. Um, and so I'm using the term kind of broadly today. Uh, and, and we can get into a little bit of this in the, in the next workshop if, if folks want, but there's like different kinds of stories, different ways to, to gather people's, you all know this, but different ways to like gather people's emotions and, and, and draw out their empathy. Um, there's a lot of talk I know in the, in the sector about like asset-based stories. Like let's not tell deficit stories about our work. Let's tell stories about like positive outcomes and positive impact. So, um, I just want to acknowledge that that we're using this term today, kind of like a broad umbrella term, but um, but we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit. So um, research does say that uh, when you think about just like basic information retention, um, people are six to seven times more likely to be able to actually like remember what the heck it is you said if it's told with a narrative base, it's told through a storytelling format. Um, and so going back to that crowded landscape of information, um, I, I wrote down a, a, a quote here um, that I found compelling, which is uh, from Andy Goodman at the Goodman Center. Um, no one ever marched on Washington because of a pie chart. And I, I think that really illustrates like what actually moves us to do things differently, to give money, to um, to ask different kinds of questions is usually stories and narrative. Just going to check the chat here. Thanks, Elizabeth. And okay, just making sure here. All right. So evaluation of storytelling. Um, today, the frame we're going to use is for you all to think about your program as if it were a movie. So the first piece of this is going to be who are the characters, the main characters in your story? Um, what are the settings and the context in which they're operating? So this is like the basic of basic way into thinking about evaluation work. And then things happen in the story. Um, we've all seen movies, I assume. And so like, where do we pick up later? What have the main characters experienced as they go along the story? So for example, in your arts organization, if you're working with youth and doing arts education, you know, the the the, the kids in the program, are going to, that they might be the main characters and they're going to have an experience. And then what is the frame on? And this is, I think, often the million dollar question um, some, for some of you, literally, if you're trying to fundraise, what is the happily ever after? Like, what is the ultimate end goal of a program that you're working on? What is it that you want to see happen with those main characters? Um, is that in Free Willy, the, the whale jumping over the, um, 
the 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 out into the ocean and finally being free? Is it the end of Frozen where the the eternal winter is finally over for Elsa and Anna? It's it's that is the happily ever after. And so be, being able to articulate that um, is also then how we back work backwards through for an evaluation perspective. All right, so you all introduced yourself a little bit already. Um, if anyone hasn't done that, um, please take a chance, a second to do so um, using the chat. So thanks for, thanks for weighing in there. Um, all right, so let's dig in a little bit to, um, to evaluation and storytelling. Um, okay. And I'm just getting a message from Hope. All right, great. We'll figure it out. Okay, so the importance of telling your story, I think you all understand this, but let's hear um, in the chat. Does anyone want to share or does anyone want to raise their hand and share? Um, we've had some people say that you think you know that storytelling is important. Um, does anybody want to share any reasons why you feel like storytelling is really important? Chat or um, or raise your hand and we'll, we'll unmute you. And I'm happy to have Joan or Cheryl Ann jump in too. Don't be bashful. <laughs> okay, Cheryl has raised her hand. Hope you got that. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. <laughs> um, I, I, I believe that the importance of storytelling is to, I, I am a very emotional person, if you will. So I wanna make sure that people feel the excitement, the joy, the passion that is behind the projects that we do. Um, so I think storytelling does a, a, a great job of reaching that person. Uh, wherever they are and uh, grabbing them <laughs> so that they, you know, pay attention to why we feel this way and um, uh, why we feel whatever project that we're doing is so incredibly important that needs funding. Thank you. That was lovely. Yeah, building empathy, um, the best way to get emotional involvement and connection. Again, straight back to some of those things that um, I already highlighted in terms of it, it being really crowded. Um, I think um, the, I'll just share my own quick recent, uh, oh, Cheryl, and you unmuted. Did you want to share something? No, you already um, got the chat. People didn't know if you caught them or not. So that's all it was trying to be a backup for you. Thank you. Um, I, two weeks ago was on a panel uh, in Massachusetts for the Massachusetts Nonprofit Network, um, there's an annual series of nonprofit awards, and folks are applying um, to receive these awards. They're submitting a couple page PDFs. Um, they they don't you know there's no monetary award for these awards, but they are you know public recognition uh, across the state of Massachusetts. There's several categories, and um, I just as a reviewer, you know, there are like 20 applicants in every single category, and I think. Um, I think, you know, immediately what stood out, at least to me, in a situation like that were the ones where there was a path into the empathy. Um, like, as a reader, just to be inundated with every single one of these nonprofits is doing incredible work and, like, what's actually going to make someone stand out. I think we're the ones that were able to, like, have a narrative arc and really do that where they didn't just tell you, again, the pie chart, Right they also tugged at your heartstrings a little bit. Um, they they made you understand the impact of the programs and services they offer um, on, on uh, the folks they serve. So um, thinking about that is, is critical. So the first piece I think we wanna think about and for everyone for going forward here, um, if you can think about your own organization and think about one program. So. Evaluation and learning can be applied, you know, at, at multiple levels. Um, but I think for the purposes of today, again, we're trying to just use building blocks to make things simple here. Pick one program. So let's say you're an arts education organization and you um, you have a uh, uh, a theater 
a theater outreach program. Think about like that, that, that piece of a program. Maybe it's something a little bit more um, systems level work. So it's like not so much direct service work. I still think you can, you can apply this with who are the main characters. So um, one of the projects we work with at the Bar Foundation, um, for example, we, we fund community foundations to help them develop expertise and capacity around arts funding. So the main character for us for that program might be those community foundations. I know I'm not sure I would personally go to a movie um, where the main characters were community foundations, but I think you <laughs> on my free time, but I think y'all can understand that. So who are the main characters in that story? I think this is the first building block. And um, I'd say a couple other things. When you think about your main characters, um, uh, has anyone ever watched like a TV show or seen a movie where you can't keep up with all the characters? Like there are so many characters that, or read a book, right? Where it's like, um, you have to take notes to be able to keep track of the story. I think that's a sign you want to hone in on who the main characters are. And this can be a little bit tricky with like, uh, with some more of like systems level work. Um, we'll talk about, but I think for the purposes, like pick a project and think about like, who are those main characters? All right. And we're going to, we're going to dig into that and talk about that one in just a second. But I think the second thing we want to think about when we're telling, uh, we're doing a storytelling approach is what is the main action that those characters, um, are going to be engaged in. And I think a lot of times in 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 nonprofit and program work, um, sometimes we see like there's a lot of different activities and the same thing can apply here, but kind of keeping it simple about thinking about like, what is the activity that they're doing? Like in the movie that you're watching in your head about those main characters, what are the things that they're doing? The third thing that we want to think about is um, the scenes in the movie that tell us like, how do we know like what happened to those characters? So those like big moments. Um, what do you see when you think about those characters going through those actions? And then this last piece is what I was talking about earlier of how does this impact our main characters? And this is really like the half, typically like, there can be near term issues, but the, or near term outcomes, but this is like the happily ever after moment. Like what do we want the ad to be at the end of the movie? Like what's the problem that's been resolved or, um, you know, the, the rom-com, like they, they're happily ever after. So we're going to walk through each of these in a little bit more depth over the course of the next um, 60 minutes or so. Uh, those four key building blocks. And I'm also then going to weave in the pieces of the of how those then fit into a logic model. Okay, so it's your turn. You've picked a program. Um, the brave among us, um, since we're not going to do breakout groups, since we have a pretty small group today, um, can anyone share with us or be thinking about uh, or share with us in the chat or raise your hand to share who are the main characters you are gonna are are gonna take along the narrative journey today? Okay, so we have artists in our artist residency program. Great. And we have Daniel raised his hand. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is Daniel Menzoni, 36 years in Arlington doing the Argentine Festival, and it's coming, the annual festival is coming uh, on June uh, 3rd, and uh, we have 21 artists in the show, and we work for one year, bringing the most important folk music group of the history of Argentina. They are people with 50 to 55 years 
uh, in the folk music. They are singers and they are number one in the history of the folk music of Argentina. It took us um, about uh, 20 years to bring them here. Uh, we brought them here 20 years ago to Arlington and now we are bringing them back probably at the end of their career, perhaps their career may end soon in one, two or three more years. But after the pandemic, they decided to, to try to do something and they selected the festival to do a tour in the United States. That will be so the main Daniel, character. Daniel, are these going, are these artists the ones who would be the main character in your in movie? this festival, yes, they will be the main. But then okay. we have a second one. That's a, that's that's perfect. We're just sharing really short, um, really short sentences in the chat about who the main characters in our story would be. Yes. Thank you, Daniel. And we have some great ones in the chat. So we've got um, incarcerated in Alexandria, uh, choral students in grades seven to twelve the students attending the opera in the classroom program, local artists who are using uh, space for both rehearsal and performance. Fantastic. Um, all right, so we have those main characters in our head and we can start to now think about them as um, the ones we're gonna track, the, the, the folks we're gonna be watching through our movie. Okay, so I've given you the path, the general path of um, this storytelling model. I'm going to complicate things a little bit now, but hang with me because they're going to actually overlap. But let's talk a little bit about logic models. And maybe since folks are doing such a great job in the chat of sharing, I would love to hear in the chat um, how many of you have developed a logic model before? whether you've been part of a process with a group, you've tried, you've been a brave person who's tried to do it on your own. Um, how much are y'all using logic models in your work today? And it's totally okay if you've never heard of the term. Um, I've tried. <laughs> awesome, thanks, Hope. Um, <laughs> I tried to. Okay, I, we'll have to dig in more to what, you know, you feel like you tried. Okay, Jason's a regular user, working with a researcher, great. All right, so, oh, great, excellent. Cheryl Ann says, um, we worked with Washington Evaluators about borders to develop a logic model for our grant program. Um, never heard of the logic model? Okay, Daniel, we're, we're ready to teach you today. Thank you for your, your honesty, I appreciate it. Um, all right, so what is a logic model? Um, the logic model is a graphical illustration of the essentially the causal relationship uh, of your program's resources. So, okay, and then we've done theory of change. Theory of change is absolutely similar. Um, evaluation people, Jane, could get into like a really long conversation about um, theory of change versus uh, uh, logic model, but I will not bore you. Um, the I think the logic model is. Uh, is would typically be most applicable to a program in part because the logic model sort of assumes that there's like a causal chain of things that happen. Theory of change can be a little bit more loosey goosey in terms of like, okay, I'm trying to do like a larger a larger set of interventions, and I think these things are gonna. Not I think, but I I'm confident these things are gonna connect in these ways. Whereas the logic model is great for program level work because it can really cut through like, I have these main characters. We're gonna do these activities. Um, or we're going to have these resources to go into these activities. We're going to do the activities. These things are going to happen. Then these things are going to happen. And this is the ultimate impact. So a um, couple other ways to think about a logic model, a roadmap. We're going to start here and we're going to go here. Um, a visual pathway. Um, I mean, really, they're, they're designed to be visual documents. Um, and they, they we'll, we'll dig into the, the elements here. So um, logic models are used a lot. Here's one that the NEA has for their Arton program. Um, this is a like very high design, highly designed, like, you know, pretty one. Um, I have seen plenty of 
fantastic logic models that were made in a very simple word table or even in Microsoft Excel. Um, what makes logic models strong, um, while this is nice and engaging because it has you know bright colors and visuals, um, the what really makes a logic model strong is that like clear path from beginning to end. Same thing like with a movie that actually like you know follows through. Maybe there's some cliffhangers. Maybe there's a plot. There's a plot. Um, but but again, you want to think about that that arc. So um, the main components of logic models and this we're going to dig into more in the second session. In fact, the materials you're assembling today, starting with your main characters, we can then work on workshop two and actually feeding it into a logic model. But I want to give you kind of the major pieces to be thinking about. So um, here are just a quick snapshot of, it, of, of what those pieces are. All right, so the key components of a logic model. The terminology that we typically use in the evaluation field, it varies a little bit, but this is generally the ballpark. First, people serve their target audience. What does that sound like? Um, that's really, for the story you're all telling, you already all nailed it in the chat, that's your main characters, right? Like, we are trying to serve, um, uh, you know, this population. Those are the people we were really, we're really, like, mapping their narrative journey. Um, the second thing we're not going to talk about a ton, but it is related to stories, are things like input. So things you actually need um, to execute the project or the program. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more what that is. Um, the activities, again, the things you do, this should sound familiar from the narrative arc, what happens in the movie. And then the outputs and outcomes, those are two different things. We'll start to talk about that today a little bit more in the second workshop, but that's both like how you know something happened in the movie and the happily ever after. All right, so people serve target audience. I already alluded to this. Um, these are the folks we are serving in our program. Inputs in a logic model tend to be the things you need to actually be able to execute your program. So inputs are things like grant funding um, or other donations. Uh, oftentimes inputs can be things like volunteer time or um, uh, just, you know, labor, people's staff time. Activities, again, the things you do in order, so if it's arts education program, the classes you teach. Uh, if it's a, let me go back to the chat to look at examples. For Daniel, um, the activities are your festival. Uh, that's, that's probably, th and then there's probably other activities, Daniel, that you're doing, I can imagine, all year long, and you've been doing for if I read 36 something. years in. Yeah. In, um, so, we have so, this uh, special activity for the first time in 40 years, the Argentine Grill, uh, that is going to take place one day before. This is something we've never done. It. It's, um, it's unbelievable with three chefs coming from Argentina for the first time in 40 years. Amazing. So see, you're, as you've been evolving your own festival, you've been adding activities to, to serve additional outcomes. Um, so for the festival, it sounds like you have this, this new piece and then the festival itself. And then, um, outputs and outcomes again, these are the things that happen and the happily ever after. So going back to be thinking about your main characters, um, can I ask you a question about the output? Uh, yes, I think uh, so. Uh, I don't know if you move it quickly, the output, but uh, can you rephrase it again? Yep. Uh, Is that better? I think so. I didn't see it. Um, the, uh, okay. I, I think he's wanting the definition for output. No, and yeah, then, something like that. But it seems to yeah. be people. I see people there and results. There you go. Are, yeah. So, Daniel, typically outputs, as you see here in the middle, um, Often, this is the difference between outputs and outcomes in the evaluation world. Outputs are usually things you can count. Um, 15 people showed up to my workshop. Yeah. 3,000 people came to my festival in the 36th year. Um, we had an artist residency that served six artists over the course of the year. We raised um, $350,000. Those are usually outputs. Um, they can, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rory, they can also be considered um, key performance indicators. 
Yes. So it would be the number of programming hours, the number of artists engaged, the number of people served, that kind of thing. I know in the arts world that outputs, you know, yes, are like, um, my spouse is actually in the arts field and in one of her earliest um, jobs, she worked in a theater in New Jersey. And as, uh, as the youngest person working in the theater, it was her job, every performance to count how many people were in the audience. You know, like how many, forgive the phrase, butts in seats, like to be able to then put that into their database and to know like we sold this many tickets, we had this many people in the audience, et cetera. So those are, those sometimes are, and outputs are really important. What outputs don't usually tell you um, or don't tell you is like, what kind of experience did you have when you saw that show? Um, when you went to the Argentinian festival, um, what was your experience like? How did that help you feel connected to perhaps your Argentinian heritage? Um, how did that help you connect to, um, you know, Argentinian culture, or music, or so outputs are things you can count, and oftentimes the outcomes are the the more um, the sometimes the less tangible things, the change, the longer term behavior changes, um, things you learn. So you, ten people went to the workshop, but what did they actually learn? Uh, things you might do in terms of behavior change. So hopefully that helps you, Daniel. So I muted myself. So I'd like to get you all back in the chat. Um, thinking about your main characters in your story here. Uh, you know, and feel free to push yourself a little bit here. What are the kinds of things that your characters are doing or experiencing in your movie? So we can have folks put that in the chat or raise your hand if you are feeling like you'd like to share. And it would be good if people already use um, the um, logic model or have done some of this evaluation stuff um, to kind of um, share your experience. And I'm thinking specifically, Jason, um, you, you use it a lot, so it'd be nice to hear how you use it. Okay, and I'm seeing a lot of adjectives. Well, I'm seeing some adjectives here, but I want you to think about like, um, let's let's give it more narrative. Like, let's describe what it, like, what they're doing and what it looks like. And through the lens of a character. So, um, Jane has a good one. Changes in self-perception and in some cases behavior. So that's Yeah, good. Jane, and I want to push you to be even more specific. So like, if you're willing to share, Jane, what do you want your, how do you want your main characters to behave differently? Like, can you describe that? And hope it looks like we have a couple of hands raised. I want to speak. Is that okay? Okay. So I, I what I, the students, and I'll say from experience, is that there's like um, an epiphany that like offers. Oh my God, this is cool. <laughs> um, which is, I guess you could. I, I think I have a hard time often expressing that in a narrative form other than like, you know, that joy and excitement that they have that after the event, like, oh my goodness, I didn't know that that could be so cool um, in those comments. So I, I think when I express it in the narrative, it's like a, as a follow up, you heard the students say, and I saw the excitement on their face and they had all these questions. So I, I often, um, just depending on what I'm writing, it, it can it can be a little weird. <laughs> and Jane, you had your hand raised. Um, yeah. And then Sarah, right after. Can you hear Jane? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, Jane, don't know what happened, but we can't hear you this very second. You might want to try again. Jane.
Jane, it might be your connection series with the uh, oh, there we go. End of there each go. of our art series with different kind of website. Jane, we had a hard time hearing you. Could you start from the top? Hi, I don't know what happened. Sorry. Um, can, can you hear me? Yes. So at the end of the series, uh, comments are things like, um, the class was amazing. The teacher showed me a different way of handling situations. She's great because uh, one of the key life skills, and we are teaching life skills as a Okay, Jane, we lost you again, but but we got a piece of that in terms of like what um, and the the comment before that from Sherelle, and I think I'm pronouncing your name right, but please correct me in the chat if I'm not. So um, I think I'm hearing a couple things um, through art. Uh, when we work with, um, let me see in another one. Those who have been incarcerated, I'm talking about kids, but at least that they're aware that they are, they can act and respond to different ways than they normally do. Okay, that's great. Okay, so a couple pieces that I wanna pull apart here. So, and and there's like the, there's what I'm hearing are, I'm hearing the, I'm hearing from Jane and Cheryl some of the evaluation pieces and the storytelling pieces and they're, they're interrelated. And um, let me see if I can, I want to be able to, hope, I hope I can do this in an organized fashion that makes sense to folks. I'm hearing a couple things. I'm hearing you all describe like what it looks like when, you know, Daniel said great emotion. Um, uh, Sarah said learning to collaborate and like honor all the voices in the room. Um, Jason, infectious passion. And I will say a couple things from a narrative perspective. One thing you're all doing that I think is powerful, like the word infectious, um, at least in the arts world, you don't read that. Um, like you're using powerful adjectives to describe your work that are describing like passion and emotion. So absolutely use those terms in terms of like when you're writing out narrative about your programs. I think you can, um, Sherelle, you'd said like it, so it might sound funny to be describing like what the look is on someone's face when like a kid experiences something for the first time. But I do think that's really powerful. And when you're reading, when you're a reader of a grant like me, um, I think, you know, mission statements, how many mission statements, we serve this many people, like the, the, this kind of same narrative structures over and over and over again. If I see the word infectious, like my, like my spidey sense goes up a little bit. If I read a story about how like a, a child is being described as having a particular kind of experience. It might sound a little bit funny to be writing in that way, but I do think that kind of writing um, can actually like pull people into what you're saying in a different way than the like stock, the stock language that like chat GPT could write for all of us right now with a mission statement. So, so I do want to encourage you all in that regard. Like, and this is so important, I think, for the arts and creativity world because so much of what you all do is can be hard to measure. It can be measured, but it can be hard to measure. So tell those stories. There is there is narrative power here. Um, so describing what you're seeing to to funders, to audiences, to people who care about your program. Um, I mean, Sherelle, even the way you talk about your work, like you're a very emotional person. It came through in the way you talked about it. It was it was um, it was compelling. So don't stop doing that. <laughs> From an evaluation perspective. I think one of the things that I'm hearing is a challenge. It's a challenge for everyone. And we'll talk about this in the second workshop too. So this is like, we'll touch on this today, is how do you actually know? Um, so how do you know uh, that, that students are learning to collaborate with one another or like learning how to do something differently? Um, how do you know that they're learning how to negotiate and make different choices? Uh, and so if... Honing in on if that's the experience you're trying to create, honing in on that and figuring out like, okay, now we need to figure out a way to actually try to get at measuring that, even if it's not like 
a randomized control trial <laughs> to measure the efficacy of your arts program some way, whether it's like a feedback form, some loop that like confirms that that look you saw on their face is actually the experience that they're having too. So that is where you can start to build in when we're thinking about program evaluation and narrative, like, okay, we need to like capture some of that so we can tell our funders, tell people who want to invest in our program, tell people who care about our program that like we, we saw it and we know it. Yeah, so changes in a relationship are actually are, are great. Um, and I think that's where you can also marry. Um, and I'll, I'll say this too. Um, I read a lot of evaluation work. And I'd love it if more people talked about like, we have evidence that shows we kids had different skill sets from the beginning of the program to the end. And they did it with like mixed in some of Sherelle's emotion of like, we saw that not only did their skill sets change, but they lit up when it happened. Okay, you're all doing great. Um, let's talk a little bit about outcomes. So, uh, we've, we've dug into this a little bit and I do, actually, I wanna go back for one second, um, bear with me here. So. In your narrative, you can also, I think, talk about your activities, not just the experiences, but like the experience they're having in the activities and the kind of environments you're trying to create in more narrative ways. So um, I also read a lot of like program descriptions that have what I'd say are totally great, but very dry descriptions of like, we do an arts education activity or we, um, you know, we do an edu we do, we do these kinds of activities as part of our program. Um, again, thinking about it in terms of a narrative. If you were watching the movie, would you want to keep watching? Is it being described in a way that sounds like interesting? Okay, so outcomes. Outcomes are the things that are happening to your main characters. They're the specific changes that take place as a result of program activities. And when we do evaluation work, um, we think about both short term. Uh, and long-term outcomes. Uh, so, and you can also have, you can also have medium-term outcomes. Um, so this can be, um, you know, what happens right away, and then what ha might happen five years from now. All right. So let's talk about this next. We heard about your main characters. We heard a little bit about what folks want to experience. Um, what is in your work the ultimate vision? Like what is the ultimate happily ever after? And I think this question for some folks can be really, really hard to answer. And I'll give an example. Um, uh, it's not an arts example, it's a food example. Um, I, I live in Boston, the Boston area now. I used to live in, um, in Michigan and I worked with a, uh, a food, a local food initiative. Um, that was uh, working in Flint, Michigan, trying to ensure that um, people from all across Flint, regardless of their socioeconomic status, um, had access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And they, their happily ever after was not just fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, it was really that like people in Flint didn't die earlier than people who lived in the next zip code over. So they had their like through line in their program to distribute the fresh fruits and vegetables, but their like ultimate happily ever after was that um, that bigger story. So I'll say a couple of things. I think it's okay. And you're, you might have your happily ever after for your program. That might also fold up into like the happily ever after for the broader work that you're doing. So uh, in the chat, and then if folks want to continue to be awesome and raise hands, Let's hear some of the musings that you all have on where do your characters end up? Like, what is that exciting moment at the end of the movie uh, for the program work that you're doing? Maybe I'll put Arts Fairfax on the, on the spot. What's that? What? <laughs> Or one of the other MVL uh, agencies. Well, like, we see, yeah, well, we saw yeah, Russ, uh, Dean Russ. Yeah, Dean Russ has his hand up. So 
Dean, um, or Dean made a comment. Go ahead and say something, Dean, in terms of what's on your mind. Don't be shy, Dean. Well, I couldn't figure out how to unmute. <laughs> No, I just think I just think when I think about our programs for um, involving youth in the kind of singing that my group does, we try to get them just to come and be willing to consider the possibilities um, and have fun. And if they have fun and would do this again, well, that's good in the short term. We'd like to generate enough uh, good response. <clears throat> on their part that they say, boy, I think this is this activity I'm engaging in in high school. <clears throat> when I go to college or after I graduate, I'm gonna join a choir somewhere. That is so cool. And then they also, because there are adults and clinicians who are adults involved in the program, they see how doing this kind of stuff your entire life is so, is so much fun and valuable. So those are the kind of experiences. Thanks, Dean, that's lovely. Mm -hmm. I'm back. <laughs> um, and Cheryl, I, I wanted to share, I, I think for our programs, because we go to schools, we perform, and then we do workshops on how, how does opera work from the grant writing to the costume making. Um, and I think we, we go to Title I schools because it's a rare opportunity for a lot of these students. And to say, you you know, there are a lot of jobs out there, so many jobs out there, but you often hear a policeman, teacher, nurse, doctor, but you don't hear costume maker for the opera. And if somebody, <laughs> if one of those students has the opportunity to be like, oh my goodness, I just can't help but so. Um, <laughs> and as they get older, go into the field and say, you know what, I, I want to work in the opera. I want to make costumes. I want to do wigs. I want to do everything. Um, it might not be performing, but it's the back of the house and maybe they might wanna perform at some point. Um, but showing them that there's opportunity out there um, in the arts and culture world. So Sherelle, I love that. And there's a piece of your narrative there that I do wanna highlight, which is that what you're talking about from a career perspective is novel. And humans love humans love stories, right? Like I have, I have a toddler and it's, it's amazing that at two years old, like, your two-year-olds can track stories, right? They want to hear stories. She wants to hear stories about the bunny that lives in the backyard that's not real, named Bobby Bunny. Like it's, you know, imagine if to play a narrative. People like to hear the same old stories, but I think in your story, the idea that like someone would want to grow up and be a costume designer or costume maker is so different, is novel, that like that, the, no the novelty of that makes people like, my brain pays attention because I'm used to hearing doctor, I'm used to hearing lawyer, I'm used to hearing those traditional careers. So thinking about ways to do, to use the novelty of your own programs, um, novelty works, familiar stories also do work for people. So thinking about both of those narrative um, tools. Um, Jason's example, I think, is one where we see like multiple happily ever afters. And this is like, I, again, I, I think I want to endorse this. Like there's kids graduate from high school. What For one thing, Jason, super measurable, right? I mean, some privacy, potential privacy issues, but like yes or no, the participants in your program graduate from high school. Um, that's also a credential that everyone recognizes is like, you don't have to give people the data on why graduating from high school is important. Everybody knows that. Um, attending college, pursuing a BFA, that's a plus, but like that's exciting that it happens. And then you have that other piece of the happily ever after, which is, you know, 10 years down the road, that young person with the BFA is there giving back. And that like that image that you're painting, that picture you're painting there of a person, um, then trans translating like all that knowledge and and doing so in community with other people. So that's lovely. Um, I, Jason, the only challenge you have there though, is of course, um, how, you know, but I think thinking about, and again, we'll, we'll talk about this more in the next session, but the measurement piece of this, of the graduate from high school is probably data you can collect on 
most participants in your program, yeah, you track kids for quite some time. Doesn't surprise me at all. You may not even need to track how many people give back to the community. There, you might only need like two really compelling or one compelling story that you pair with of the person who did that, who like met the happily ever after, that you pair with that data of everyone. And then you're putting together a picture um, of like a holistic picture of both this exciting measure everyone understands with this like single person's narrative um, that's really powerful and compelling. Oh, lovely. Jason's gonna teach this next workshop, I think. <laughs> okay, well, thank you everyone for sharing and digging into that. So a couple of things to just keep in mind, and Sherilyn gave us a good time check in terms of the time we have in our workshop. Um, and we had some time built in for more um, breakouts, so we may even be able to end a little early and stay on to take your questions, of course. But um, in terms of thinking about the next workshop, you have some of these building blocks now, right? You have your main characters describing who those folks are, um, the the settings in which you're you're working with them. Um, that's your target population. The second piece is the experience piece, both what they're experiencing from an activity perspective and describing what they're doing. And then this next piece of, and it might be pieces, as we just talked about, of like the happily ever after. And then that next piece of the, that's digging into workshop two of how do you know that happily ever after happened? Um, I foreshadowed my own slide, um, but you did it. Um, you made it through the the, the narrative arc um, of program evalu evaluation. All right, so um, again, I think we're a little ahead of schedule here, but um, just digging a little bit into workshop two and talking about that, um, especially with a group of this size, I think the idea is that you would be able to leave the second workshop with the basic pieces of a logic model, um, including some ideas about like what to actually be measuring. We, we've dug into that a little bit as well today, but we'll talk, we can talk about that more in depth of like, what are some different tools to be measuring some of these things. Um, uh, I also think it's really important to highlight this next piece, and some of you alluded to this in the chat earlier. Um, you're not typically doing this work, and I heard some people say, like, I tried to make the logic model earlier. I never, when I was a consultant or even as a grant maker, recommend people, like, try to do the logic model all by them loans themselves. Um, logic models can be, like, really exciting um, and important, I think, strategic opportunities to engage stakeholders, to engage partners, to engage people in your own organization for a couple of reasons. I think people can bring different perspectives um, to what's in the logic model. Um, people can get in some really good conversations about like what does happily ever after look like uh, in a way that I think like feeds the energy and the passion for the work you're doing. Um, and I think that it it can be a real way to also affirm that like everyone in your organization is pointed in the same direction. So everyone understands whether they've been there for six months or 16 years that we're all pointing this program in the same direction. We all know what happily ever after looks like. Um, so, um, so I highly recommend um, like interactive logic model workshops to go back for just a second, um, one of the things that we can do, and sorry for scrolling here, um, is you can actually, this structure that you see here on this page is the kind of thing where you can have people populate that with post-it notes um, in, a, in a workshop setting and you know buy some pizza. And I know that's not everyone's idea of a party, <laughs> but, but to get people really engaged in the work, whether they're your staff or key stakeholders or actual, um, and this is, I think, a big movement in evaluation, people who participate in the program. Like, I think Dean had to sign off, but um, participants in the choir to talk about, like, what, what they hope their participation in the program might end up meaning for them in their lives. So, again, inviting people to a logic model party, um, you should have some cachet with them because they might say like, oh, like 
hope that doesn't sound like a party, <laughs> but I think, I think these really can be important tools for an organization to come together or people involved in a program to, to make sure that, and, and really engage each other in thinking, thinking about strategy. So, um, so Roy, I have a quick question. Um, am I correct in understanding that what we're going to be doing in the second work workshop is getting our fingernails dirty? You're actually going to want people to bring, um, if you can go back to that last slide, you're going to um, bring um, ideas. Yeah, ooh, ooh, that one, ooh, that one, yeah, 17. Um, you're going to want people, maybe we can give them a blank one of these and yeah. they can fill out. Um, maybe we yep. can send that in advance perhaps or have it available. And they can fill out um, the, these um, inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes midterm, short, et cetera, prior to, and then um, you can kind of be, you know, testing to see if they're, they've got their items listed as outputs, but in actuality, their um, outcomes, you know, those kinds of things. We can help clarify things. Yes. And Sherilyn, the, that last piece you just mentioned, um, I think there's a lot of pressure to like get this right, um, get these right. And my experience has always been that it's it's usually iterative. So even in group settings where you have a number of people like sitting together thinking really critically about this, um, when I was a consultant, this would happen all the time where we do a logic model workshop with an organization. We come in and facilitate it and people would put like the sticky notes on the wall. We'd have like, we were at the YMCA with the headers on the wall and everyone would get up and like plop their note on. And we'd pull everything then into, um, into like an Excel file or a PowerPoint and we'd realize we'd go back with them and we'd actually be moving things around. So sometimes like you think it's an output and you talk about it some more and you realize like, actually that's like, that's more of a, that's more of an outcome. Um, some things are really concrete and simple. So what I guess I'm saying is if you're going to bring that, do not feel like it all needs to be filled in and do not feel like it needs to be perfect. It does not be, and you might change your mind about it. And you might change your mind about it five years from now and say, you know what, we've been treating that as if it were a short-term outcome and it, I have come to realize it's a long-term outcome. So um, take the pressure off. We'll we'll give you a template and you can fill it in and bring it and we'll dig into it. And maybe we can help them, you know, realize what where it should go because they may not know, like you said. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so going to the last slides here. Um, I want to say thanks to everyone for joining today. Again, I think we can st certainly stay on um, and answer any specific questions. Hope has just popped both two things. Uh, thanks, Hope. The sign up for part two of the workshop. Um, also a survey for today's workshop in terms of how it went. Um, and then um, we'll get the template out to everyone who are SVPs. And Rory, thank you. Um, this is... Uh topic, like I mentioned in the chat early on, it's a love-hate relationship with logic models. Um, it's a, a dirty task that we have to do to tell our story. Um, and it's really hard, you know, to really measure art, you know, or art in general. Um, so storytelling is a way of doing it and having data to back the story, um, you know, it will, will help um, with funders, with, you know, just evaluators of your applications, you know, those kinds of things. So mark your calendar for June 1st um, and do fill out the evaluation form that Hope um, created the magic and put into the chat because we are also going to be planning uh, workshops for the fall. So your input is really important for us. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, we can stay on for any additional questions um, that you have for Rory or for, um, Arts Fairfax or Arlington County, um, you know, so we'll stay on for a few more minutes, but thank you, everybody. Hi, I did have a question for you all, um, or Rory, <laughs> um, because I, I, when I'm writing grants, I often try to lean away from the emotional, <laughs> the emotional, like I, I try not to pull at the heartstrings too much because I feel um, that I'm often like almost manipulating, I guess, <laughs> because it's like, I know you know what I'm doing. So, that, <laughs> so 
so then I'm like, well, maybe I should pull back a bit because I don't want to seem, I guess, so aggressively emotional in this, in the language that I'm providing. Um, and I think I often struggle with that balance. So sometimes I'm either very like pointed with the emotion and the impact and why it, it, it's so important. And then other times I'm like, this is very strictly, we're just connecting with the community. And I, I often struggle with that meeting in the middle with that. I, I wouldn't want to appreciate that so much. Um, and I wouldn't want to say that every funder is alike. I mean, there, um, there are certainly funders who I think might shy away from that. And so kind of knowing, knowing your funder audience a bit, but what I will say is, um, that my experience from two different funding settings, um, this is the second foundation I've worked for, is to just that like the sheer quantity of things we read that the that the narrative elements, some of the things you're talking about that do have emotional qualities really do help um, applications, like help folks connect to the, the application and the work in, in more right. meaningful ways. But but I want to pause to see what um, you know Cheryl Ann or other folks might say um from your perspective as well and your perspective in in the region that you're in i think having the right balance um sharing the emotion or the effect is important but if you just say that and you don't have any data to back it up mm. or any um stories to back it up um but it was really more the data or you know that you need to be able to qualify it you know somehow yeah. um so i think having that balance I think like, you know, I see Jake, Jason still on, but like Jason, I think sharing about like we, that the example I was giving earlier where it's like, you have the data on high school graduation rates and you have the story of yeah. thinking about how you can marry mm -hmm. the, the, like what Cheryl Ann is talking about, the, I mean, no, people do not march in Washington because of the pie chart, but they do want the pie chart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, but it's the pie chart plus, um, the narrative piece. And I also think thinking about different settings. So like there's the funding application. Mm -hmm. um, I went to an event last night where people were actually giving, um, nonprofits in Boston were giving like pitches mm -hmm. and they were telling, they were using narrative really powerfully because they were doing so in a, in a verbal setting. So, you know, when you're in a funder meeting, um, having a story to draw on or, or maybe you're creating some kind of video to talk about your program. I think so when you're thinking about your program at large, you're thinking about like, how are we going to fund this over the next five years? Thinking about your logic model and having like different pieces to pull out for different um, right. settings yeah. can also be really important. And I don't know, I've been in these positions where you have the data and you, or I had the data on the program, but I hadn't done the narrative work. And I didn't really have the story to tell. Like I had part of it. Yeah. I didn't have permission to use it. So I didn't use it. Um, I had the narrative. I didn't have a good photo to go with it. You know, like, so yeah. I think being also just proactive about thinking like, okay, here's our logic model. And here's actually our pieces where we're going to need over yeah. the next six months to start like trying to find some of these things. So that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to get like good photos. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of work to get the stories and get people to sign off on them being told. Yeah, I think if you just have the data, it's kind of like, so what? You yeah. Know, you get this question in your head, so what? Where do you go from here? Mm -hmm. Or using the data to show your impact, that your impact yes. is the story of what has happened. You know, so yeah, I think it's just connecting the data to the emotion that you're trying to present. Thank you. I appreciate well, it. It, it, it. It helps me <laughs> learn how to craft things better. So I, I, I want to make sure that everything comes across correctly. Jason, you're unmuted. What would you like to share with us? Well, well two, two separate things. Um, one, I wanted to, I, I guess, just say this out loud for everybody that's on the call. One of the things that I started recently, well, not necessarily recently, but started with my group um, my, you know, was to make sure that all of my teaching artists are constantly taking photos um, throughout the, you know, every single time they have an activity. And then I do a checking call right after so i get a better sense of the experience and what was going on as part of my process of 
building out artifacts and inventory for future storytelling opportunities. Um, so it's kind of planning ahead. You may not necessarily have a, a, a fantastic story to say right now, but there's an accumulation of messaging that you can that you can compile as well, even from different pictures from different kids or different things that's going on to help tell a story. Um, the other part um, that I wanted, I, I guess, to throw back to you, Rory, is really to hear from you in terms of a conversation around messaging and the different modalities of uh, messaging for different target audiences. Because how we speak to the board, how we speak to city council, how we speak to funders, how we speak to, you know, your community stakeholders like parents, they are all very, very different. Um, you know, some people may want more data, some people may want less data, some people may want more visual, some people may want more things in writing, um, but really kind of spanning the whole gamut of how do we go about the process of storytelling, understanding the different modalities that are necessary for different target audiences. Jason, I think that's a great question and so, so important. Um, and, um, probably like the 301 left, <laughs> but, but to your point of thinking about, um, different audiences for telling your story and who those audiences want. And I, I mean, I, this is where this starts to trend into communications work, which, um, in my work, even in, you know, in, I mean, even in our own foundation, like but to your point, Jason, like we tell the story we tell of our work to our board is very different than the story we tell. Not very different, but we pick out different things than what we would tell to the general public or to our, to our grantees. So, um, yes, like mapping out like who are we talking to and who are we, who are we, who not just who are our main characters, but like who's the movie for? Like there was that movie this summer that I live in Boston, so you can't get away from the New England Patriots about like Tom Brady and those, the women. Like that movie was not made for me. <laughs> like that movie, <laughs> like, I, and I didn't see it. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like there's different target audiences for different stories for sure. And so I think, yes, like also thinking about, okay, for our organization, um, you know, our institutional funders are going to want this. Our individual donors might want something else um, or our, our, our audience, we have different kinds of audiences. I think those things are all, I don't have a simple answer for you, but it is an important consideration. But I also just, Jason, I really love the thing about like, when Tiffany's gonna jump in. Um, yeah, taking pictures. I just sent someone um, for some work I'm involved in, not part of work, but some nonprofit work. I just sent someone a picture that I took 10 years ago that's relevant to a project we're working on now. It's like really fun to have this picture that actually shows this thing we're trying to do. Um, I didn't know that I was going to need to use that. And there it is. Um, Sherelle, thank you. Um, and Tiffany. Thank you for, um, for having this. It's so helpful. And um, I think one thing that we sort of are always trying to figure out is how do we tell the story um, through photos, but also through narrative. And then how are we showing the change? Um, and so this is really helping me like come up with some more creative ways that, that we're, you know, how are we speaking in our, in our grant proposals to how are we showing this to our donors and even like the principals in the schools who are having an increased, you know, like participation in what's going on. Um, it's hard to showcase what's happening with the students when they're not there physically in the room. So I'm just thinking about how do we show what we've learned from a previous program to how it's going to change, how we're designing it differently into the next season, for instance. So how, how this can be a part, um, this approach that you're presenting can be a part of that. So thank you. This is, I'm excited for the next one. Oh, thanks, Stephanie. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and the measurement piece is, there's, you know, there's a lot to talk about there too, in terms of the, the work that it takes to measure, like Jason was talking, was mentioning in the chat about following folks over time. Um, that's no small feat. Um, you know, having view, like it's, it's so often that even in my own work, we don't have baseline measurements. So we have to, we have to either create them 
um, I'm working on a project in our own foundation where we, uh, we finally have two years of data on something and it's, it's only two years of data, but it's wonderful to be able to compare one year against the other. And it was a, it was so much work to just build the little tiny system we built. Um, so I'm, I guess all I'm saying is I, I'm fully appreciating that these are not, there are not simple answers here either to like demonstrate how we actually know. So I want to make sure that there's 